And so indeed, we are now done with the four panels of the Baltic Sea Security Conference and have arrived uh, to the closing remarks uh, by uh, Lieutenant uh, General, uh, retired Benjamin Hodges, uh, who will speak about the fragmented security approaches in the Baltic Sea region and challenges for the transatlantic community. So uh, please, uh, General, the floor is yours. Hey guys, everybody, thank you very much for the uh, privilege uh, to be a part of this. And I can only imagine uh, after sitting through several hours of virtual uh, presentations, um, that the, the last thing you want is a general uh, with a microphone at the end of the day. So uh, I still appreciate uh, the opportunity. I'd like to use this opportunity to uh, hit five sort of key points. And um, uh, I would, of course, if the organizers would, would want me to, I would, I would welcome questions or challenges, but otherwise I will, I will go through these five sort of main themes. Uh, the, the first theme, is uh, I sincerely believe that great power competition prevents great power conflict. And by this, I mean competing in the diplomatic space, in the information domain, in the military domain, and in the economic domain. When you don't demonstrate that you're willing to compete somewhere, then potential adversaries like the Kremlin or the Chinese Communist Party will fill that vacuum. And certainly just in the last 12 or so years, uh, there are several examples where the United States, uh, the West, NATO uh, did not compete. The, the most recent one, of course, is in Nagorno-Karabakh. And so now here we are standing on the sideline uh, and you've got Russian peacekeepers um, there in uh, Azerbaijan in Nagorno-Karabakh, as well as Russian bases in uh, Armenia and of course, they still occupy 20% of Georgia. Uh, we, we failed to demonstrate any interest to appreciate the strategic significance of that region. And so the Kremlin, of course, had no problem moving in and filling that vacuum. Same thing is true in Crimea, uh, Donbass, uh, and even in Syria. Um, the, the Russian support, Kremlin support for the Assad regime has put millions of refugees on the road into Europe. Uh, that was not an accident. That was intentional collateral outcome, uh, what General Breedlove refers to as a weaponization of refugees. So when we don't demonstrate strategic interest, we don't compete, then we have to end up living with the, with the results. And that's why I think it's so important that the West competes in the Baltic region in all of these domains. And part of that, of course, is figuring out how do we get the initiative? How, how does the West maintain the initiative to protect our friends, uh, to ensure freedom of navigation, to ensure uh, prosperity, uh, the, to protect against all the different types of threats that the Kremlin uh, will use in that region. And then, of course, um, all of you are familiar with what the Chinese are, are looking to do in the region as well. And so we have to compete in diplomatic sphere, information sphere, military, and economic. Now, I think Sweden's decision to uh, put military, to put troops back on Gotland Island, for example, is a great signal of competition. Uh, not only was it a recognition of a real threat, but it also tells the Kremlin that, hey, we're not just gonna sit back, that we're gonna put troops back on Gotland Island because we really do believe you guys might try to seize Gotland Island, which would change the, uh, the geometry and the uh, balance of power in the Baltic region if Golden Island became a, a Russian base or islands off the coast of Finland, for example. These are important. Now, that means we also, in the diplomatic sphere, we have to be willing to push back on the uh, traditional false narrative that comes out of the Kremlin about how the West is being aggressive, how we're closing in on, uh, on Russia, uh, when in fact, the safest part of Russia's frontier is the part that touches NATO in Finland. That's the, that's the one area where we all know they're never gonna be invaded. Uh, yet most of their military is in the Western military district or, or a significant amount of it, as well as in the Southern military district where they don't have threats. So in the diplomatic sphere, we've gotta be willing to push back uh, on this false narrative in every venue. And I think a good example was yesterday where the, uh, the delegations of the United States, the UK and Estonia 
at the United Nations uh, released a statement uh, condemning Russia's uh, attempt yesterday to claim that they were the uh, neutral mediators in the Donbass and that they were doing their best to implement Minsk. Uh, and of course, they were blaming the Ukrainians for failing to do that. And I think it was important that Estonia, the United States and UK together uh, push back on that narrative because we all know that that's not true, that it's the Kremlin that um, uh, provides leadership, troops, and endless amounts of logistics and technical support to the so-called separatists there in Donbass. But that's an example of where you have to push back in the diplomatic sphere as well against that narrative. The second sort of theme or point that I would wanna uh, share with you, of course, is what's the United States? How does the United States look at uh, the Baltic region? Um, the Biden administration uh, will be in power uh, effective 20 January uh, on the day of inauguration. Now, this is going to happen. Uh, this, our, our transition of power right now is not exactly elegant or a thing of beauty, but it's going to happen. And the, uh, the, the checks and balances system, I think, is proving that it can withstand even the uh, assaults it's under right now. Uh, so I feel very confident about that. Um, I think the Biden administration will uh, eliminate all doubt about America's commitment to Europe, about American commitment to NATO, uh, and about American interests uh, in Europe. And I think also, I expect a Biden administration will be more clear and more firm in dealing with the Kremlin. Uh, there will be a lot less Mystery. Now that doesn't mean that it's going to be perfect, uh, but I, I feel uh, I feel much more confident about um, how we're going to interact with our European partners and allies, as well as with the European Union in competing with the Kremlin to make sure that countries in Europe, uh, as well as the United States, I mean the EU is our top trading partner, um, that we have stability and security in the region. Of course, uh, we have some signals or indicators based on uh, the nomination of uh, Tony Blinken to be the Secretary of State. What we're all anxiously awaiting is the nomination of who, for the, who will be the Secretary of Defense. I think that will also be a strong signal. Um, all of you are able to read the same things that I read about who the candidates are or the possibilities. For a long time, people thought it was going to be Michelle Flournoy, certainly. Uh, she's well known, a lot of experience, um, a former Undersecretary of Defense for Policy, which is kind of the number three position inside our Department of Defense. But um, I'm less certain that she will be the secretary now. Uh, there have been a lot of, there's been a lot of pressure on President-elect Biden to uh, select a couple of other possibilities, whether it's uh, Jay Johnson or maybe even General Lloyd Austin, General Retired Lloyd Austin, and there's a couple of other names out there. So we'll see. But that'll be an important signal uh, about how the Biden administration um, will uh, approach security issues in Europe. And of course, all of you know, um, in most, as in most governments, it's not the guy at the top. It's, it's the women and men at the second and third tier who actually focus and, and develop the policies and implement the policies um, for the different regions. So that'll also be an important signal for us to watch. Regardless of who the secretary is, uh, there's no doubt in my mind that the Biden administration will also continue to focus on China and the threat posed by the Chinese Communist Party. Um, I think that uh, they'll have a different approach than the Trump administration, but the desired outcome or the recognition of competition is still going to be there. Um, I hope I'm wrong, but I, I do believe that we're going to be in a kinetic conflict with China uh, within the next five years. I'm talking of not, not nuclear, but I'm talking about ships, planes, missiles, uh, these uh, illegal uh, militarized artificial islands out in the South China Sea. Um, I've just seen so many different things um, from the fact that the West really did not respond, not even the UK uh, did not really respond to uh, China's uh, crushing of dissent in Hong Kong. Uh, the language about Taiwan is becoming increasingly uh, tough, militaristic. And I think that the Chinese, the PLA, the People's Liberation Army, which is all of their military, 
I, I really believe that they are looking for a fight. That I mean, there is an aggressive language as well as operating style, uh, and the development of their navy is moving at the pace that the United States Navy was moving in 1944, building ships 24/7, uh, uh, trying to grow capacity. What we don't know is how good they are, what kind of operational capabilities they actually have. Now, what does this have to do with the Baltic region? Um, what does this have to do with our partners and our allies in Scandinavia? Uh, this is about U.S. capacity. I believe that the Biden administration is going to expect a strong European pillar to help continue deterring the Kremlin in case the United States is focused in the Pacific, in the Indo-Pacific region, uh, in a particular conflict. And that especially will affect our ability to bring in uh, Navy capabilities, uh, Air Force, special operators, uh, intelligence, those things will have to focus. And so there's a sense of urgency to make sure that we have a strong European pillar, not a European pillow uh, to help deter the Kremlin. So that'll be an expectation. And that means there won't be a whole lot of US Navy sailing into the Baltic Sea or operating in the region. It won't be because they don't care. It'll be because there's not enough capacity. The third sort of main point I'd wanna make is, what assumptions are we making about Sweden and Finland? I personally, um, I don't spend any energy or time or, or I don't fret about whether or not Sweden and Finland uh, should be in NATO or want to join NATO. These, these are decisions for the people of Sweden and Finland. Uh, what's important to me is that there is a shared view of the threat and that there is a coordinating uh, apparatus for exercises, for intelligence sharing, for, for operations um, uh, to provide, ensure security, stability, freedom of navigation, fair trade, and protection of our liberal democracies and all of the nations of the Baltic region. So that's, that's what I care about, not whether or not Sweden or Finland are in the alliance. Uh, again, that, that's the choice uh, for those nations. Certainly, I would expect they would be very welcome. Um, I would love to see that, but I don't spend any energy on that because I think uh, we're on a good path right now with exercises. Um, when I was commander of U.S. Army Europe, having U.S. soldiers participating in exercises alongside Finnish troops uh, was a fantastic experience for us or participating in the exercise Aurora where we had the Patriot battery deploy all the way from Germany um, up into Sweden and uh, US Army helicopters and, and working on these kind of things. And of course, uh, our soldiers loved serving alongside Finnish and Swedish troops as well as our allies in the region. We do make assumptions though about basing. We do make assumptions that we would be able to move through Sweden, for example, or to use air bases. Now, this is me as a retired guy. I don't have access to any kind of special um, classified information anymore, but I would assume and expect that we would be coordinating with our uh, partners in Sweden and Finland for the areas where we would need to cooperate, share information and, and have access to the extent that's acceptable to the populations and governments in Sweden and Finland. The fourth um, sort of topic that I would want to uh, address is about, gets, I'm, I'm going to focus in now more specifically in these last few minutes on the region. Uh, the fourth one is military mobility and rapid reinforcement. Uh, some of you may know we just completed a workshop hosted by SEPA, the Center for European Policy Analysis, where I work now, uh, where we looked at five different scenarios of how we might move uh, NATO forces or Western forces, perhaps even an EU force from Western Europe into five different locations. Scenario number one was moving from Norway into Estonia. Scenario number two was moving from Germany into uh, Lithuania through the Suwalki corridor. Uh, scenario number three was moving from Germany into Romania and the Folkshan Gate region. Scenario number four was moving from Germany into the Western Balkans. And then scenario number five was moving from Western Europe into Libya. And the point of doing this workshop was to identify and figure out how do we 
how do we improve our ability, uh, the, the ability to move as fast or faster than any potential adversary as an essential part of deterrence in peacetime? And that's the key. Uh, I think uh, all of our civilian leaders don't always appreciate that this military mobility is not about making it easier for US troops or Germans or Brits to, to do exercises. This is about giving our political leaders options, something other than a liberation campaign into Lithuania or Estonia or Romania, to be able to demonstrate that we can move as fast or faster. So the scenario that we picked for the high north was to move from Norway into Estonia because we knew that would require us to uh, have to figure out, okay, how what needs to be done to move through Sweden. Um, and then also, uh, we would have to transit the Baltic Sea, which would probably be, potentially could be contested and then get into uh, Estonia. So a pretty challenging scenario. Uh, I think many of you are already familiar with many of the challenges that are out there. I would say probably 90% of the solutions um, are going to be in the responsibility of the European Union, uh, the European Defense Agency, and the nations, because we're talking about the legal and diplomatic aspects of crossing borders with military equipment, ammunition. Uh, it's during peacetime conditions, so regulations that still are in effect, uh, and, the, and the willingness of nations to allow this sort of transit um, before it, it's an actual crisis, which is, of course, the whole point. And their infrastructure is critical and, and cyber protection of infrastructure is critical. In fact, I would say cyber protection of seaports and airports is just as important as missile defense of airports uh, and seaports. I'm, I'm sure all of you are familiar with the, uh, the uh, story of the NotPetya cyber attack that, that shut down Maersk a couple of years ago for several weeks, cost hundreds of millions of euro, uh, and they were not even the actual target. They were uh, a collateral damage, and, and yet you could see the damaging effect to our transportation infrastructure with a very, very simple cyber attack that was actually targeting a Ukrainian tax office. So uh, investment in cyber protection uh, of our infrastructure is just as important as um, the actual infrastructure itself. I will say that what um, is happening at the Riga airport, I read uh, earlier, about um, 500,000 euro being invested in Riga's international airport to expand its capacity uh, for host nation support uh, to support NATO operations. And I think we're talking about more ramp space, for example, ammunition storage and handling. These are the kind of investments that are necessary um, that don't look like tanks and jets and, and artillery and submarines, but yet they are just as important. In, in fact, now that I'm an old guy, all I care about is logistics and transportation and you know, how can we move and, and that work has got to be done ahead of time. And I think that the Russian Federation forces, if they look across the border, and they see that we don't have infrastructure. They see that we don't have pr protected transportation assets, redundant, that, that could, uh, is resilient enough to, to absorb some losses and disruption, then I think uh, that raises the risk of them making a terrible miscalculation about our willingness to fight. So this investment is, uh, I think is very important. Now, um, the fifth and final sort of theme, I, I, or the way I'd like to use these last few minutes is to name some specific areas where I think uh, we can improve our deterrence capability and, and therefore uh, lower the chance of a terrible miscalculation. And it's how we look at the Baltic Sea. Um, I think, frankly, Americans and maybe even uh, other European uh, capitals too in Western and Southern Europe are confused because we always talk about Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania as Baltic states. But actually, of course, Poland, Germany, Denmark, uh, Sweden, and Finland are, are Baltic states. And, and even the southern tip of Norway could almost, because of, of its ability to help influence access into the uh, Baltic Sea or egress, so there are several Baltic states. And when you step back from the map um, and look at it in that way, I think that actually we have a significant advantage in terms of geography and capability as long as we work together. Um, just the, the sheer number of nations that are there, 
I suspect that uh, in the Kremlin, they realize that Kaliningrad is actually a liability. Uh, I mean, it is physically surrounded by NATO allies. Um, it is within range of all kinds of capabilities that should we choose to do that, that it, it could be neutralized if that was a requirement. Um, so I, th I think uh, we want to maintain that. We want, we, want to make, we want them to feel very uncomfortable so that they don't make the terrible mistake of, of think, trying to initiate something in the Suwaki corridor, for example, which obviously is why Bel what's happening in Belarus affects the Baltic region as well. And I think back to this diplomatic competition, um, no way in hell that we should be um, standing by idly while the Kremlin figures out what it's gonna do in Belarus. We, sh we should be doing everything we can, the way, frankly, that Lithuania has uh, to support uh, people in, uh, in Belarus so that the Suwaki corridor does not become this, this narrow piece with Russian troops, Russian ground troops based in Belarus. Uh, I think the, the combined, I'm not a Navy guy, I'm an infantry soldier, was um, that I believe that we have the potential to achieve sea control in the Baltic Sea on very, in a very short amount of time if we're all working together, given the combined maritime capabilities of uh, the nations, uh, the NATO nations and our partners, Sweden and Finland in the Baltic Sea. So, and, and of course, the fact that we could totally control um, the straits between Sweden and Denmark. So I think the ability to achieve sea control there is very real. That needs to be practiced. And I think we need a, a headquarters to kind of coordinate that. Now for NATO, JFC Brunson, Joint Force Command Brunson has that sort of regional responsibility. Uh, but I think I like the German offer of the Baltic Maritime Component Command in Rostock as a coordinating headquarters where they wake up in the morning smelling uh, the Baltic Sea and it's a headquarters that can coordinate intelligence sharing exercises, operations so that we've got an unblinking eye on what's happening in the Baltic region. Uh, I am very worried about uh, Air and missile defense, and in fact, in, in all of uh, in all of NATO's eastern flank, there are different capabilities out there. But I know, at least in the last seven years, we have not had a joint multinational theater-wide air and missile defense exercise. You know, this is not um, Cold War days or or Second World War, where the gun looks up, sees the plane, and shoots the plane. I mean, now sensors, shooters, uh, headquarters. Are, are spread across three or four different nations. Uh, missile defense systems are uh, underway on ships in the Baltic Sea, for example. So you have to exercise um, to, to pull all this together to, to figure out how are we able to make sure we're not shooting down a civilian airliner as happened uh, in Iran uh, with a Ukrainian uh, civilian airliner just a few months ago. So the uh, air and missile defense is one thing that really concerns me. I am encouraged that Sweden has chosen uh, to uh, is part of the Patriot community now. But for me, it's, it's less about what system it's have we exercised and are they all connected? Uh, Lithuania recently, of course, has purchased or accepted delivery of NASAMs. These are important steps. But I think that Germany has got to play a much more significant role. This, this Germany's position in Europe, its geographic position as well as its economic power, it is the transit state, it's the hub for NATO, for EU military. It's the place, the power projection platform for all of us. And so I think that would include not only host nation support, but also um, air and missile defense for the region. Okay, I think that I have covered uh, all the main points I wanted to cover. Uh, I really, uh, I, wish, I wish we could have done this in person and, and I look forward to the day when, when we can all meet together again and, I will stand by if there's a, a question or uh, wish you all uh, best wishes for good health. Thank you very much, General. Uh, thank you very much of all the speakers and participants of the conference of today.